All right, continuing on here. Um, definition. T, uh, linear transformation from V to V, is diagonable, or again, I would say diagonalizable, if there exists a basis beta for V consisting of eigenvectors of T. All right. Now, um, theorem. If you have a linear transformation from V to V, T is diagonable, if and only if, the minimal polynomial is the product of distinct linear factors. All right, so here's the proof go. First of all, suppose it's diagonal, right? Uh, order the eigenvalues of T distinctly, followed by repeats. In other words, let the first S of them be distinct, and then let the rest of them possibly repeat, okay? Then the minimal polynomial, well, I don't know it's the minimal polynomial yet. <clears throat> I'm hoping to prove, in fact, it is. So here it is. You form it by the product of x minus a to 1, x minus a to 2, da, 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 x minus a to s, where these are just distinct increasing eigenvalues. Uh, well, okay, fine. I mean, this is nonsense, right? If, if we're in the complex, I can't order them in this way. I mean, fine. I, what I'm trying to say is you, you don't have to have this ordering. That's, that's kind of really beside the point. Um, the point is you have distinct ones, all right? You, you collect S distinct eigenvalues and form the product like this of the of the first S distinct ones. This this I'm too, I'm keeping it too real up here. I'm, I'm sorry about that. We don't have to have an ordering in our field. Oops. Okay, so um, if i is a natural number, we can express m of t, right, as t minus a to 1, da, 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 t minus a to s, right, t minus a to i. I just pulled out the ith one like that. They're commuting, so I can pull the ith one out like that if I want, right? Thus, if we take m t i uh, acting on v i, then what happens? Well, um, what is vi? I don't think I said what vi was here. Well, let's figure it out. So this, then the x and that, t of vi minus eta, eta, that should be eta i. And then what was my next step? You can see what it is, assuming, what am I assuming? I'm assuming 4 uh, vi, an element of the kernel of uh, t minus eta i, or in other words, you could say t of vi, right, equals to eta i vi. I'm, I'm assuming that vi is a um, characteristic vector with characteristic value eta i in, in the language of Curtis, or an eigenvector with eigenvalue eta i in my usual language. And um, so, of course, when that, they cancel, right? And then you feed zero to this. Well, this is a composition of linear transformations. When zero gets fed zero, it spits back zero, right? Um, but on the other hand, i is arbitrary, right? So since we assumed that um, t is diagonal, if I have that m of t is zero on each one of the things in the basis, well then by the linear extension theorem it follows that m of t is zero transformation, right? And um, <clears throat> that alone doesn't prove it's a minimal polynomial, but it proves that it that the minimum polynomial has to divide it, right? Um, at a minimum, um, it's in the minimal polynomial is in there somewhere, but that 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 you can't remove anything though. The thing is, m of m of x is is, is good as it gets. If you removed even one factor, like the ith one, you'd have the product of x minus a to j for j not equal to i, and for this m star, this deleted, um, reduced polynomial, if you will, um, if you feed that vi, well, you get um, the product of a to 1 minus a to i, a to 2 minus a to i, da, 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 a to s minus a to i times vi, but these are all non-zero. Vi is an eigenvector, so it's in the basis, the eigenbasis, for this diagonal transformation. Um, so it's not zero. So, well, this isn't zero. And, um, well, then this isn't zero, right? If there's even one output which is non-zero, then m star of t is not zero. Consequently, you can't have a smaller polynomial, um, which, uh, in other words, one with less factors than m of x. Um, 
which would have smaller degree, of course, and uh, it's not possible. I was arbitrary, right? So that, that shows that, that, in fact, m of x is minimal. And for, the, and for m of x, all the factors in m of x are necessary for the annihilation of t. Therefore, m of x is the minimal polynomial. Man, this calculation, this is just almost spot on the thing I did um, to prove the uh, linear independence of distinct eigenvectors, uh, eigenvectors with distinct eigenvalues, right? This is, man, this is almost that calculation exactly. Anyway, just saying. Um, conversely, if you have an endomorphism and um, you have the minimal polynomial, is the product of distinct linear factors, like so, all right? And again, I, I, I shouldn't say this. This is not, this is too real, sorry. Then, by the primary decomposition theorem, note that V is, because, all right, these are the prime factors. Linear factors are prime factors, okay? These are not repeated, okay? So that makes this like the P1, the P2, the PS. And so by the primary decomposition, we get V as the direct is the sum of the kernels of these guys, respectively. But um, by the way, if you have the direct sum decomposition, you form a basis for each thing in the direct sum. You can string the bases together like this. That gives you a basis for the whole space. And you can easily verify that, in fact, that basis is an eigenbasis because the things in beta 1 are eta 1, they belong to the root eta 1. The things in this kernel are eigen, are characteristic vectors belonging to um, characteristic value eta 2 and so forth. Therefore, t is diagonal. All right. Now, the way I define diagonalizability was a little bit different in class. Let's stop and, stop and talk about that for a minute here because I, I figured out what I was confused about. Man, I almost had it the other day, but here's the deal. So how to show diagonalizable matrix has n linearly independent eigenvectors, all right? So we're looking at p inverse AP equals to d, where d is the diagonal matrix, and p is the, is the matrix formed from these n linearly independent eigenvectors, all right? So if I, re if I multiply this, right, I get AP is equal to PD. Um, but you see, um, well... What, what does that look like? Well, by concatenation, that looks like, uh, you know, the, so I have, of course, the matrix of P. I guess I don't really need a matrix here. I, I don't know why I wrote matrix P here. I don't need the, well, I guess those are just ordinary brackets, whatever. Anyway, concatenation brings this P inside, like so, right? And so you got like PE1, PE2, PEN. Well, what are those? The P, I mean, P, P, E, I, is equal to the ith column of the p matrix, right? Which I'm just denoting by pi in this calculation, all right? Um, here. But then the lambdas right along. Right on the other hand, on this, from the same thing, you've got like ap1, ap2, da, 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 apn. Well, okay, so if this is, equation is true, in other words, if a diagonalizes, then this shows that um, in fact, the columns of the diagonalizing matrix, P1 through Pn, are eigenvectors with corresponding eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda n. Those being the eigenvalues, the, the values which appear on the diagonal. This, is the, this was the direction I couldn't, I couldn't see how to prove in class. So, um, in other words, that diagonalizability implies the existence of an eigenbasis for A. Well, the eigenbasis for A is exactly nothing more than the columns of the diagonalizing matrix. <laughs> Which is, I should have expected, because that's what we did the other direction, essentially. Oh, but anyway, so the columns of P, uh, columns of P yield the eigenbasis, uh, duh. So again, March 11th, 2016, I got lost on the way to this. It's almost absorbed into Curtis's definition of diagonal, this, this here. Um, but anyway, here, here's something for your, for, for your reference. Um, there exists P in the n by n matrices over F such that P inverse AP is equal to this diagonal matrix, all right? In other words, what I'm saying is A is similar to the diagonal matrix with lambda 1 through lambda n on the diagonal, if and only if there exists an eigenbasis for A over the n by n matrices, in the n by n matrices over F, which is true if and only if LA is diagonalable. Di diagonal. Here, meaning that there exists a 
basis of eigenvectors or characteristic vectors for the linear transformation L sub A. These are different ways of scratching the same itch. Um, so there you have it. All right. We will at times refer to this, I mean, we, we use this result as we go on, this idea that if, if you have distinct linear factors for the minimal polynomial, that is in one-to-one -one correspondence with diagonalizability is, is an important fact to know. We do use that. All right, one last thing on diagonalizability, and then I'll, I'll be done with this little bit of our extra magic hour videos here. So anyway, um, <laughs> this one I'm not going to prove. <laughs> the proof is in Curtis, <laughs> I think. Um, S1 through SK be a set of diagonal linear transformations such that they're pairwise commuting. So SI, SJ is equal to SJ, SI, all right? Um, of course, I mean composition here, but uh, for all I and J with, you know, for all K of them. Then there exists a basis for V, which is simultaneously an eigenbasis for each SI all at once. I mean, that's what simultaneous means, of course, but... Um, page 200 of Curtis, I, I say I'll probably guide you through an argument in your homework. I don't think that's entirely true. Um, I, I have invited you to work it out. I have a book which has a number of exercises which will guide you through it. I have assigned it as like a bonus exercise in some previous year. I can't find my solution just yet. I don't remember it being particularly easy. Um, but anyway, it is one of the more interesting results. Um, I mean, Dr. Scambordis has taught this to a linear algebra class back in the day. Um, okay, now I'll leave it at that. We will actually use that theorem that I just stated soon enough, but I, I just want to comment a little bit more on the physical meaning of that theorem since I have something to say here, not much, but a little of something. In quantum mechanics, physical observables are measured by how operators act on eigenstates. For example, if you have p hat, which is an operator acting on the wave function, wave, uh, wait, yeah, wave function psi, if that's equal to p psi, well then this p is the, the eigenvalue of p hat. Um, if, for example, if p hat's the momentum operator and psi is a momentum eigenstate, then this little p is actually the, the observed value of momentum. So the eigenvalue is used to label the state. So this typical notation would be like psi is equal to this ket with a p in it. So p acting, uh, p a hat acting on ket p would be p ket p. Um, this is a common notational scheme. Another example, in the study of angular momentum, you have the total square of the angular momentum, which is jx squared plus jy squared plus jz squared. You can show that that commutes with the zth component of angular momentum. I have not shown that here, but you could show it. Um, well, anyway, in other words, the commutator, j squared with jz, <laughs> jz, um, is zero. And, um, hmm. Is Jay-Z a smooth operator? I think technically yes. Yes, I think it is. But, um, so, uh, yeah, so there we go. Um, these commute, and then that theorem that I was just not proving applies. So you can find eigenstates which are simultaneously eigenstates of both the total angular momentum squared and the zth component, all right, at, at once. You could label, um, an eigenstate with like J and Jz and then like Jz. And uh, I mean, I saw that in my quantum mechanics course as we studied angular momentum. This was an important bit of, of the story. Um, but perhaps what's even more important is what you can't do, right? Um, if the, for example, the momentum and the position operators, um, these do not commute. I mean, quite famously, this is like equal to IH bar or something like that. And where H, H is the... Um, Planck's constant. So there does not exist a simultaneous eigenstate of position and momentum. This actually is tied to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which says you can't measure both of these at the same time precisely. I mean, if you if you measure something and you know its eigenvalue, that means that you, there's no uncertainty in it. I mean, the momentum is p. It's not p plus or minus something. It's just straight up p. And so if, if the commutator is not zero, it means we can't find a simultaneously a simultaneous set of eigen states, which means you can't measure both position and momentum in the same experiment both at once. There's There's got to be some uncertainty of one or the other. 
And so that, that's an interesting um, bit. But of course, a lot of the development in linear algebra and the mainstreaming of it has in part been tied to quantum mechanics, at least a little bit. I think probably equally so, just the manipulation of large data sets, especially more, more recently as powered by computers, is probably more, more of the reason. Certainly quantum mechanics has also played a large role in the development of functional analysis where it's, it's certainly needed. Um, anyway, so that, that's about all I have to say about diagonalizability for now. And next we'll be going on to the triangular form theorem. Thanks.